Hi. So we're going to crack so in. So in short, we're looking at a survey of different approaches to doing stuff. So we'll start off. Can you put your hands up? This is very interactive. So I hope you're not feeling laid down by lunch. Put your hands up if you've been asked to supply an estimate, either in time or cost or anything else. Good. So far, so good. So the problem is that apparently there's been loads of studies with the five uh, documented by Steve McConnell, he says that there's somewhere between 60 and 85% of those estimates are wrong. And it boils down to the fact that a, a, uh, an expert in the field, like we all are, when asked for an estimate, the problem is it doesn't make us an expert estimate. Fine. Uh, and so and this is a problem, obviously, because we are supplying the estimates, and yet we're getting it wrong quite a lot, a lot of the time. So, uh, assuming that you don't want to use what have been termed by us as wild ass guesses, then the question is, well, how do we go about this? How do we do a better job at estimating uh, going forwards? I'm going to cover off that this is not a, just, just, not, this is not a discussion about whether or not you should estimate, because that's probably a conversation another time, certainly we can take up a whole session. So the approach does depend on what you're trying to do. Right? And so the question is, why are you being asked for an estimate? It's a good starting point. If you know why you're being asked for the estimate, then you can normally get to the position of, well, how am I going to go about doing it? Uh, and so what we're going to do is we're going to go through five methods, uh, ranging from probably one you've used before to hopefully one that you've never used before, but we'll see. Right? And uh, we're going to ask you to help us out by getting involved. Uh, so one thing to think about as we go through this, though, is why are you being asked estimates? Because not one of these approaches is necessarily going to be the best all the time. It's going to depend on why you're being asked. So there's a clue, though, in that because the boss wants it, it's not the right answer. So our first approach. OK, we're going to ease you in nice and gently. Um, so we're going to talk about story points and velocity. So, can you be your hand up if you've never ever used story points or played planning poker or we've done any of those sorts of things? Just one of you. Okay. Well, you might actually be in a better position because um, everybody else in the room will have heard at least one, if not several different definitions for what is a story point. So, I decided for this talk to go with um, Mike Hogan, the sort of king of planning poker. Uh, and this, this is how he turns it. So they're a unit of measure for expressing the overall size of a user story or feature. They tell us how big a story is relative to the others by <coughs> terms of size or complexity. So for me, the, the key piece there is in the second sentence. So it's relative sizing. So against something either that we're going to do or perhaps better off, something we've already done. And it is really size and complexity. It doesn't mention time at all whatsoever. Um, you may recognise these, apart from one person at the back. These are planning poker cards. We've got some here. Um, these are mounting goat ones. I think we've got mounting goat ones. So we're looking for four volunteers, please, just to come up and help us with an exercise. Anybody up for that? So if you want to come up to the front, that'd be great. Thank you. I didn't tell you to bring up the front. We're going to come up to the front. So while they're doing that, um, so picture the scene, right? You're in this, you're in our favorite meeting, the planning meeting. Um, we're gonna have our development team over here. We've got me, who's the scrum master, and for the purpose of this exercise, I'll also be the product owner. Um, it's not gonna take very long, so don't worry about that. We've got our product backlog here. In this case, we've got five dogs. And what we wanna do is um, come out of this meeting with our sprint backlog and kind of, um, an understanding of what we might be able to achieve within the sprint that we're about to plan. All right, so we have the Chihuahua, we have the Terrier, we've got Collie, we have German Shepherd, and we have um, the Great Dane. So the first thing that we might do is um, set ourselves a benchmark. Now, like I say, that could be something that we've got in the um, product backlog right now, or it might be useful to use something that you've already completed so that you have a better understanding of what size that, that story or that piece of work actually was. Uh, in this case, to save time, I've got it for you. So, the Terrier is a three-point dog. And we're going to now story point against those. So, our development team is here. Um, they may have kind of varying degrees of skill. They might be um, have uh, varying degrees of um, longevity in the company. Some people might have more domain knowledge than others. So, what we're going to do is play planning poker because what we want is everybody's 
personal understanding of what that story is, not what somebody else's understanding of that story is. So hopefully having done this, we come out with a size um, for that story, but, but also a shared understanding of what it is. Um, so I'm just going to show you a dog. Um, this is a free print dog, and I want you to... What do we do to these dogs? We're going to size them. Train them? Size them? Size them? not train them. We're just going to size them. So that's all right. Yeah? So relative to the dog that's already out there. Okay? So the first dog is the puppy. So if I just say three, two, one, go. One ready? Three, two, one, go. So we've got three fives there and an eight. So what are you doing? I'm not very good at my job. <laughs> okay, this is not self conscious. <laughs> uh, so, any kind of. Any I remember, I, I, I just worked on the terrier, so I didn't really know how to do it. So. Okay, so hopefully that's going to prompt a discussion that we're not going to have right now. Um, <laughs> that will give these guys a shared understanding of why that poly might be five. Actually, it looks like it may turn out that way. Or uh, why um, this lady might be able to convince everybody else that it's an eight. I would have said six, but I thought it was six. So unfortunately, that's, that's the way the technology is equal to that. Okay, so second one, last one quickly. Three, two, one, go. So having a great game relative to the Terrier. You've got two thirteens, an eight, and a twenty there. So why do we think that one was an eight? Well, it's just, it's not, you know, about three times the time. Seems that one. Depends on the volume, like. Yeah. So we are, so you're slicing that relative to the log that's already there. Thank you very much for doing that. We see the rest of the So that's a really quick example of how that might work. Obviously, in practice, you spend a lot more time with um, So we've got our sizes. Also, what do we do with that? Well, we want to, we, the aim here is to actually build some kind of estimate that we can communicate out. So we want to understand what our velocity is per sprint. Um, very simple mathematics, total story points divided by number of sprints. If this is your first sprint, then obviously your velocity would be the number of points that you completed in that first sprint. Uh, if you've done more than one sprint, and as you start to build up information, you're going to get more confidence uh, in the values that you're, or the estimates that you're giving. Um, so the math is very simple. We use an example here. Five sprints, 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70 points delivered in those sprints. Divide that by 250 points, divided by the number of sprints, gives you a velocity of 50. All right? So how do we then turn that, so how do we understand how big our project is and how long it will take? Well, I'm not going to kind of insult your intelligence by reading all that out for you, but I will give you a few seconds just to check whether I've made a mess of it. Um, so yeah. Just to call out on the right-hand side here, while I was researching this talk, and um, I had to go onto Mike's website to find that quote, I also found this quite handy velocity calculator. So if you probably bother to do the calculation yourself, you can go to this website, and it's there. So I plugged it in, exactly the same numbers, uh, and it came out with exactly the same answer as you can see. So I used using median, which in this case turned out to be the same as the average that I used to calculate. Um, the nice bit of it is, though, at the bottom here where it talks about confidence. So it says you have a median velocity of 50, and there is a 90% likelihood that your actual velocity will fall between 30 and 70. And that seems really uh, obvious from the data that we've got here, but the more data that you build up, um, the more useful that statement is going to be when you're communicating with your stakeholders. Okay, so, that was story points. Um, you take questions yeah, we'll try to listen. We might. Do you, do you ever use yesterday's weather when you're doing story pointing and velocity? I'll come on to weather in a bit. Let's. We, we'll, All right. We'll, is, is it, is it a, a tool or are we talking a general. Yesterday's weather is the oh. last sprint. The last, the last five, they're using the previous five sprints. So they're using yesterday's and the day before as well. So there's all sorts of different methods. Like, you know, some people say take off the bottom three and the top three and just use yeah. those. There's all sorts of different ways to use okay. yeah. um, All right, so we're going to move on to Kanban now, Kanban metrics. But I just wanted to get you thinking about flow as a concept before we move into that. So on which side of this motorway is the traffic flowing more quickly? Is it on 
your left hand side or on the right hand side? So on the right hand side, yeah. So if you were on, on which side of the motorway would you be more confident about being able to predict the length of your journey or the time it's going to take your journey to your journey? Because obviously you're on this side, right? Um, if anyone was in the lunch queue today, you're probably resting right now. <laughs> so I am standing on the right side, that's good. Um, so I'm just going to give you a few definitions for those Kanban metrics and just a little understanding of how you might be able to collect those numbers. So this is a fairly standard whiteboard. I've literally just drawn this one so that I didn't have to take a picture off the internet. Um, but we've got ready, development, test, and live. So live is what I consider to be done. Um, and we have our whip limits at the top there. Um, working on the premise that some of you may know Kanban, some of you won't. Um, so, the first piece is lead time. So when it's the pull system, so when the developer pulls that story in from ready into dev, I simply write a date on that ticket. And then when it gets to live, I write another date on that ticket. Um, so that's the definition of lead time. It's the amount of time it's taken to get through from the beginning to the end of that system. Um, next we have work in progress. So if we throw you back to that previous slide, there's a lot of work in progress on the left-hand side of that motorway, and not very much work in progress on the right-hand side of the motorway. Hence, the right-hand side of the motorway was flowing a lot faster. Um, and width can be, uh, can be taken from the number of stories that you actually even work on, so that you have in play at any one time. So it's not the sum of the width limits, it's the actual number of stories that you have in progress. And again, I simply note that down every day and record it in a in a very basic spreadsheet. And the last one, the third one, is delivery rate. So that is the number of work items that you complete, i.e. cross this line, per unit of time. So I tend to do this daily, so I'll record it daily. So it's the number of work items that we complete daily, that we finish daily. Um, if you didn't want to do all of this for yourself, and you were looking for a template to do it, you could, um, you could do worse than looking at Hopper. Um, he has a very good one which uh, we actually started uh, to use when we first started Canada. And I'll have anything to say. Okay, so the other, the other record that you might want to take per day <coughs> is the number of, I'll go back to this actually, is the number of um, items in each column. And if you do that, you're able to diagrammatically display. Uh, your lead at lead time with using a community flow diagram. So what this gives you is the number of work items in each column or in each section and allows you to calculate lead time going across this way and width going up this way. So the thicker the, the, thicker the band, the more work in progress you have, the longer the gap between uh, ready and done, the longer the lead time for your system is. So how do we, how do we use these to create some kind of forecast? Well, Little's Law, as engineered by John Little uh, from Queuing Theory, um, has um, kind of defined the relationship between those three things, so lead time, work in progress, and delivery rate, and expressed it as an equation. So average lead time equals um, average work in progress, divided by average delivery rate. And you can rearrange that equation to express it in terms of both work in progress and delivery rate as well. Um, and there you have it. So you can use the output of that to create your basic forecast. So your forecast is the number of work items. So if you had a project that was, I don't know, 10 stories big, the number of work items divided by your average delivery rate plus your average lead time, which is the time it takes uh, for the first story to go through your system. Right, but we do have to be very careful with this. I think it's going to talk to you in a minute about um, how you can extend this. This is a very basic forecast. If you want to know a bit more about that, Daniel mckenzie has got a, a great ebook where he talks about it, and he's quite adamant that you should slap anyone who uses Little's Law to create forecasts. So is it. anyone using Little's Law? Because we can we can miss the sacks on McKenzie's behalf. <laughs> so David is going to take you through how to make those a little bit more robust and give you some confidence, which is the key word in those. Cool. So Next, we're going to go on to the Monte Carlo simulator. So, has, who's, who's heard of the Monte Carlo simulator before? Who has used them? Okay. Who would like to have used it but didn't really understand it? Okay. So, 
A multicolor simulator is another way of trying to forecast what's going to happen in the future based on what you know now. Now, the problem is for lots of things, especially things I, I personally I, I've done, I know something about what's going to happen, but often I'm unsure exactly what's going to happen, right? It's very, it's very rare that I know exactly how something's going to go. So, for example, start a new business or you've got a startup or a new product. Uh, let's use an example. So, you might know that you're going to sell between 10,000 and 100,000 items. You may know that you're going to sell each of those items for somewhere between 5 and 10 pounds. And you might know that your cost is somewhere between 100,000 or 300,000 in that year, in that first year. But there's quite, that's quite a big variation. So what do you do? Do you take an average of each of those? Do you say, right, we're going to take the average between the middle ground between 10,000 and 100,000 items. And we're going to take the average cost of 7 pound 50 that we're going to sell them for. And we're going to take our average um, outgoings. And, and then we're just going to have a figure at the end of it. It doesn't really work like that, and that's, you know, it's, it's unlikely to happen. So what a Monte Carlo simulator does is it takes a random figure between your uh, ranges that you give it, and it calculates it as a, as a single instance, or an iteration as it calls it, massively confusing for most of us. And then it does it again, and then it does it again, and then it does it again for thousands, or tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of times. And it then starts to build a model based on, uh, on your answers. So something, so this is an example of a Monte Carlo simulation. I've put a, I've got a link. Uh, all of these things, all of these sections, we should have said are um, either are or will very soon be blog posts on Scrum and Canaman uh, But this is a I, I've just kind of created a very simple Monte Carlo simulator and stuck as a link. So you can go in and make a copy and play around with it. So so these up here are the green boxes are our, um, our lower and upper bounds that you can put in, and then these are the these are the calculations it runs over and over again. So I've only done a thousand in this because it's, it's quicker, or 100, I, don't, I, did, I did very few. But it then plots a graph of roughly what your outcomes are. So here is, I'm gonna make less than zero pounds, so we're gonna make a loss here, and then it's gonna go like that, it's something like that for the outcomes up to 100, down or 1,000 or whatever it is, so it only draws it. And so um, that is roughly how a Monte Carlo simulator works. I mean, obviously, you know, I'm not gonna go into the details of how to build one, but the, uh, the benefits are that it actually uh, allows you to put in this minimum and maximum rate. So you've got to think, obviously, the downside is you've got to think about what is the minimum, what is the maximum I'm expected. You can't just stick any of things in. But the, and it does take a little bit of time to build one of these properly. But the massive benefit is that you can say, well, what would happen if we managed to bring our costs down? Or what would happen if we uh, sold them for less? You know, maybe five pounds was a bit over optimistic. And um, within a press of a, a few buttons, you can find it and just automatically run them and your model over here that it's built will change. So you can see, well actually we're a lot likely, we're a lot less likely to make a profit if we increase our costs or whatever. And so again it's taking guesses a bit like the, for the planning poker because you haven't done anything yet, whereas Cameron is taking this is what we've done, um, unless you've already had some experience of what you're going to of what things you're putting in. So it is very much based on what you know now and you've got to think about that. Um, there is one word of warning, is that some Monte Carlo simulators, I think it's Douglas Hubbard, I don't know if you have heard of Douglas Hubbard, he's got some sample um, systems on one of the Monte Carlo simulators, and I think it's actually putting your break-even points, and actually gives you a probability of breaking even. So I did one for, for my business when I started it up, but it came out with an 80.34% chance of success. If I was taking that to a boss and saying, well look, we've done this thing, we've planned this, and this is the likelihood, of success, it implies kind of a pseudo mathematical outcome. But well, that, that is what it's going to be. It's, it's an eighty point three four percent chance, right? But you press the button and run them again, and it will change. And depending on how big your variance is, that is less you know, it's less likely to happen. So I would steer away from those again if you have to use those for some reason in fun. But th this is going to be a better output because it's actually going to show you the, um, the layout. Part. Are you stretching, or do you have a question? Or one there's a lot of problems with Monte Carlo stuff because it's assuming a completely uniform statistical distribution, which is absolutely not true. So, that is a problem in assuming their certain distribution, which nicely brings me on. You could build one, didn't Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you'd have to have the distribution you're expecting, you don't. There are, there are problems with all of these things, right? So, I suppose it's, yeah, knowing that that is. <coughs> 
that you're going to get more things in the middle of those ranges um, because it's bigger range really sure. And how much time you want to invest in actually like creating your asset portfolio forecast? So we handed out some post-it notes to people. So if you've, you've got a post-it note of 10, right? we're, going to, we're going to move on to Gun Simulator now. We're going to move on to calibration. Uh, so if one of the most common ways of estimating is to get an expert's opinion right, or an expert judgment. And it's very nice and quick and easy and people can give their estimates. Uh, and you can apparently, Stephen Conant does have a service so that if you practice this enough, you can get better at it. But being an expert in field research, it doesn't make you an expert in estimation. But you can, in theory, practice it and practice and practice and get better. Right? So uh, we're going to talk about calibration for a little bit. So if I asked you, for example, to estimate the average rainfall in September, you might start by saying, I have no idea. Right? Which is, that's not true, because you've got some idea. Right? What you might do is say, uh, as I asked Jim, uh, is it 62 millimetres? Well, it's very unlikely to be 62 millimetres right, in September because it is more likely to be less or more than that. Right? It's very unlikely that Jim is going to predict exactly right. So, what would be better is if I said to Jim, what's the average rate in September? And he said, well, I'm 80% confident that it will be between 0 millimetres and 100 millimetres. So he's given me a range, as we were saying earlier with Monte Carlo millimetres. Having that is at least then saying, I don't know, and I'm X confident, right? 50% confidence is slipping at all. So, uh, so we're going to try it, okay? So I'm going to ask you, if you've got a post note of pain, to give me a lower and an upper bound, so a min max, of how many volcanoes you think there are in the world. You need to be quick, because we've only got five minutes for that topic. So, and then I want you, when you've done it, to hand it to someone who's next to you. And when you get given a post note, could you hold it up so I know that when 10 of you have done that? Okay, so one, two, three, this is like an auction. Four, five, come on now. So, if you have the answer um, of 1500 somewhere in between those ranges, could you keep your hand up? One, two, no, you've got 1500, so 1500, so four of you, okay. So, four out of ten. So, in theory, uh, if I asked you, uh, I have Mr. Fundamental Parts, I was going to say, give me a 90% confident make it, but you are pretty sure that your answer is going to be in between them. And the government basis that was implied in the uh, if I ask you 10 questions, right, I'm saying give me a 90% uh, confident figure of being in between these two things, you should get 9 out of 10, right? Okay. Uh, the problem is that most people are very overconfident in their estimates and give a very narrow range. So, uh, McConnell's and Hubbard's and lots of other people have tried this, the average is 3 out of 10, right? Because people believe that they are much better estimating, even though volcanoes is obviously not your industry. I don't know, is anyone a volcano expert? It's a you feel. Um, people are people give these very narrow ranges. Right? So uh, I did this study again. Some of you have called me already and said uh, I filled in this questionnaire for you a little while back, and you didn't come back to me. So I asked people twenty questions with these ranges of things like, I don't know, if you remember, what's the price of the full share going to be in a month's time, whatever. And I had to let people do did research. I, I allowed people to do some research on it. So you could see what a full share is now, and then you could say, oh, guess what it's going to be in, in a month's time. Uh, still, when I said, make sure that you are giving me a lower and an upper figure where you're 90% sure that the answer is going to fall between them, I didn't say give me a narrow range. I just said, just give me the low where you're sure. Of things that you could research on, the average still only came back because people were getting five right. So I've done this a load of times with different things. One of them I used to McConnell's uh, example. His was when was Alexander the Great Wall, and one of the one of the people in the group who was giving these estimates uh, said something like, 
Okay. He was between 3000 BC and 4000 AD. Okay, so he's yet to be born and for, for many millennia. And still she only got five right by giving answers like this. She got that one right. Uh, so the theory is that McConnell and Hubbard and others put forward is that if you do enough tests like this about things like volcanoes or the surface temperature of the sun, that you can actually calibrate yourself to be giving better estimates in the job you do. Because obviously they're not something relevant to your career or your job. And they go through a, a number of approaches to do it. Okay, so I'm not going to cover all of those. I'm not, this is not a training session. I had to calibrate myself. But most people are massively overconfident. Okay, so one of the tricks is start very, very wide, absurdly large, and then start to narrow your estimate until you start to say that's not absurd. And then you probably, if you're giving a 90 percent accuracy, somewhere in the region where you should stop and give that estimate. Uh, you need to repeat this, you need to give feedback, or you need to get feedback often. So you need to do it, look at what happened, do it, look at what happened. Um, and again, in uh, Hubbard's book, if you've, if you've seen that, there's loads of tests in there which are similar to that. Um, again, there's going to be a blog post about this, there's already one covering calibration of it. Uh, but one of the key things is that you do not assume, you don't build assumptions into this, right? You don't say, well, I'm giving this low and upper bound on the assumption that. Your assumptions should be built into that range. So if you are unsure, your range should be bigger. Um, I had a practical use of this when I was working with one. I'm working with Ford recently who said, could you give us an estimate of when we're going to finish all of the things that we would like? And we went through as a team and we broke it down to reasonably big things. And the <coughs> estimate came back. It was somewhere between 28 and 56 weeks. And that's a massive range. Right? The first project was only six months, the start of that. They wanted, they wanted to do more than six months, and they'd already done six months. And most of the time in the past, I would have been ashamed to have gone back and were scared or reluctant to go back and say, well, it's at least the same time again, but possibly twice what we've already had. Um, but that's the reality, right? Like, we were so unsure. Some of the things had so many unknowns in it that we had to have to be perfect. Uh, so, <coughs> I'm going to whistle on. I haven't been for time. Okay. So, the final one is, uh, I'm going to ask them for some more volunteers, because I've got a bag of spuds here. Right? So the last one is students T statistics. So who's heard of this? So uh, this is William C. Gossett, and he worked at Guinness in 1908. Uh, we did plan on having Guinness here for our stream, because we thought that was a good way of getting beer to build it into the talk, but we can't find Guinness in the student talk. Uh, anyway, he, in 1908, he came up with this idea that he could take a very small sample of barley and, and work out which fields had the best yield of barley. Uh, a little bit of background why it's called Student's Tea Statistic rather than Gossip's Tea Statistic is because Guinness was paranoid about people who were in their seat. Perhaps someone else had done that in the past. And so they said, no, you can't publish as Gossip, who works for uh, Guinness. Uh, he said, well, I'll publish as a student then. So even though everyone now knows it's Gossett's uh, T-statistic method, it's still very student's T-statistic. But it's a very simple formula. If you take a very small data sample, if you only have a small data sample, uh, you can forecast what's going to happen next. And it works very well with small data samples. So I've got my kits and scales here. For some reason, I brought potatoes with me rather than buying them here, uh, which doubled the weight of my luggage. Uh, <laughs> it's not like I've got any potatoes in Cornwall. <laughs> they don't have Oxford potatoes, though. So, uh, right. so uh, I, need a, I need a volunteer, a different volunteer, if I said come and take some spuds out of my bag. So if you could... Uh, <coughs> <coughs> so if you could take a spud and stick it on my scales and tell Jim how much that weighs. 170. grams. And then another spud. We, we are going somewhere with this, right? 159. Right, okay, thank you. Right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to you later, but thank you very much. You can take those with you, yes. Oh, thank you. <laughs> right, okay, so what we do is I'm gonna whistle through this, right, because um, I'm not gonna ask you all to remember student statistics. So what you do is you add these together and get an average, right? So I'm gonna oh, slide it all the way down later. Um, so we'll see. I could probably do some head, but I certainly could do the next bits, right? So, uh, 170. Plus 159. Uh, it's 329 divided by 2. This is a bit like countdown. 164.5 is the average. 
Yeah, sounds about right. Okay. We then take the average off each of these. Uh, so hang on a second. Sure. We knew this would be the slowest bar, right? So what is uh, 5.5? 59. Take off, recall. Uh, and one is minus 5.5, of course, because it's the only two data samples, right? You then square each of those. Okay, so squared is 30.25 on both of them, because they're the same. Square. Uh, so if we had more samples, what we do is we would then divide that number by the number of samples minus 1, okay, which is in this instance 1. So we don't divide it by 1, because so that's pointless. Uh, we would then divide by 2. Right, so 30.25 divided by 2 is 15.125. I'm just grabbing my trip sheet to make sure that the uh, machine is, isn't making me do something wrong. Okay. We're going to take the square root of that, which is 3.889. And that gives us our, oh sorry, no, that's yeah, square root 3.889. So then what? This is where it changes from other maths. This is what Gosser then says, right, then what we need to do is times that figure by our, um, our sample error amount. Right? So when we've got a small data sample, we times it by a larger number, and as the uh, sample data the sample increases, we reduce the number. But for two samples, we're going to times that by 6.31. Right? So, so 6.31. And that gives us our sample error, which is 24.5. We'll go with that. So if we now add that to our average, uh, what else? So we get 189 as one. And then we take it off. What's it, 24.5? Uh, yeah, that's right. Potato, our next sample. Pressure's on there. Never do, never do exercises with live animals, children, or potatoes. Should be between 140 and 189 if C D Gosset is worth his weight. Paul, would you like to grab one of my spuds? <laughs> There's no trick, I'm not gonna potato hidden up my sleeve. <laughs> So the answer is, I can't hold it up because the potato is 175, right? so it is in between our sample, right? If we, were then, we then have three samples, we would repeat this process, and instead of timesing it by six points, oh, what is it, 6.313, we times it by a smaller number. And as you go along with more data samples, it's, uh, you, you times it by a smaller figure. So it's a very quick way of doing it. Now I've run, uh, along with my estimates when I was asking people to fill in, I ran this on 11 different topics, everything from how long a tennis match with Wimbledon would run to how long a coffee queue took. Uh, it's, it's great, I, mean, I, I have loads of fun. Uh, and it was fine with small data samples, but as the data sample got bigger, it got a lot less accurate and it started to fall apart. For some of them and others, it was very, it was very good. So, uh, for example, the length of the next track in Spotify and the tennis match were pretty good because they were quite consistent. Didn't have a lot of variance, but then as you put the stuff that had massive variance, Gossip's T stat uh, fell apart. Uh, so it has its benefits, and uh, so I'm going to say if you're doing Yes, so it, uh, it is good for small data samples, but it starts to fall apart and you have lots in my experience. So I think that the thing is, does it work for you? Maybe it does. It depends on your reference. Right, I've side thrown from my slides, so I'll just stop working. Jim, you're going to do this without any slide. I'm right. You can see it here. Yeah. There's no one else can. Okay, so if you can see the slide, this would be much, much better. Um, I'm gonna, we're just going to conclude now. So we've got a, a few slides, or just me talking for a few minutes without slides. Um, we've mentioned Douglas Hubbard a number of times now, so and we haven't quite filled our quote quota for the talk. So um, <laughs> Douglas Hubbard um, talks about measurement a lot, and really what we're doing here is measuring. So his measurement or his um, 
definition of measurement is a quantitatively expressed reduction of uncertainty based on one or more observations. So what we're not trying to do here is give anyone hey, give anyone certainty. We're trying to we're trying to in effect reduce certainty, uh, reduce uncertainty. We can't predict the future, um, but what we can do is give ourselves um, a, a better chance of um, being able to plan against at least some data. Um, and as I say, based on one or more observations. So you've just seen this one through a number of different things. In that last one, we, we used three different observations for three different potatoes. With the Kanban metrics, we had three different um, uh, pieces of information. And um, with the planning program, we're using story points, we're using velocity. These are all very, very easy things for us to collect. Um, and they're very readily available. Not a lot of work to it. Can anyone tell me what this is? What well, this is a picture of? Badly drawn. The really badly drawn code of uncertainty. Yeah. So um, what this what this is there to express is that at the beginning of a piece of work, so um, as far back in time as we can be, we know the least about the work that we're about to undertake. So therefore, we're going to be less certain about how long that's actually going to take us to complete. And all of the methods that we've used are ways of trying to reduce that uncertainty. As time goes by, and we do some work, and we learn from it, we, we get much better at being able to um, predict this endpoint here. So that's why we sort of feel that um, when you're going to give, if you are going to give an estimate or a forecast, and, and you feel that's the right thing to do, you should do it in terms of a range like this, with a level of confidence attached to it. Um, Right, so you get back to work on Monday morning and you're walking down to see the CEO and you're about to go in and tell him that that project that you picked up last <coughs> week is definitely going to deliver on the 17th of March 2017. Um, you should um, have John Maynard Keane's words ringing in your ears. It's better <coughs> to be roughly right than precisely wrong. And again, that's another reason for giving these ranges, for giving a level of confidence. So do we think that Guinness can help you estimate? Possibly not, but we do think it might be able to help you forecast. Thank you very much. So we have about five minutes left if anyone wants to ask us any questions. Or put up thoughts about stuff such as all distributions. I'd like to ask you about your yesterday's weather as well. If you, uh, I think I it. Yeah. Well, yesterday's weather is what you did in the last sprint. And um, I kind of do both measurements. Because yesterday's weather is based on, you know, sometimes how many people you have working during the summer holidays. It's going to be yesterday's weather because outside of the summer holidays, it's more uh, continuous averages of your velocity. So I try to measure both of those at the same time, just yeah. to give me, it just gives me more information. Yeah. The more data you have, the better stuff. Yes. Some people go in to do ideal hours, and they, they do some yes. very complicated calculations about team capacity. That would seem like a lot of hard work. But yesterday's weather <laughs> is never more than the last one. In your team statistic calculation, what's the error rate that you applied in six point three one well, there for two samples? Was that off of some standard lookup table that gives you that figure? So six point three one is that's a gossip. That's a figure so that there is a table that's a table. Yes, right. Right. and it goes down. Uh, yes. Yeah. I did write the next one down in case we have time for potatoes, but I can't remember. It does jump quite widely once you have three. Uh, it goes down to three or two or something. Yes. So the two guys there. Um, a lot of your estimates uh, that you, you can talk about rely on you having the data. So ignoring the question of whether we should estimate, um, and certainly where we do estimate in the organization, working, but we do a lot of estimates of sort of business case estimates. So we think this product will make this much money. And as a technology person, I have to supply how much I think it will cost to develop that solution based on no previous, but we don't have a lot of good time started, you know, we don't have work in progress yet. I know the scope is going to go all over the place. I mean, it's, 
Angel so, for help? So, well, so can't you say, well, I'm 90% confident mm -hmm. that it will be between 20 grand and 4 million. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? But there's kind of a, a, a wake up call in that, in that you are saying, you know, this is, this is actually where I'm actually <coughs> confident. I presume you want me to give you an hour of range than that. So I'm going to guess at this. And you're kind of saying, well, you've asked me for something. I know people only hear the actual last thing you give them, right? But I've identified the fact that you really don't know, and there is this massive range between what it is. And it goes back to my four lesson, right? It was between six months and a year. And that's not what he wanted to hear. He had to go back and ask for a specific single amount from the finance people in the court. Right? They don't go with ranges, or they don't pay on a monthly basis. They budget. They build cars, it's planned, you hit that exact date on that exact budget. But it's a nice trade off as well, isn't it? Because you, you just said that your, your um, business partners have had to um, try and estimate or forecast how much money they're going to make. So in return, you're then having to say how long it might take and, and what it might cost to build it. Yeah, I've got, I mean, that's the, the bit you're talking about, the Monte Carlo was quite interested in that, in that you've got, so there's an estimate how much we're going to sell, what the price is, what the cost is, there's also an estimate from my side. And, what features you'll actually be able to deliver and how much, how long it'll take, and what sort of cost. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Feels a bit more like a collaboration then, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you've got a budget, uh, what you really want to do is hire Hubbard, because he's got, a, I don't know, I mean, his book has about probably 80 different approaches for estimating stuff. It's not some book, and it might take a while to get through it. Uh, but again, lots of them do go on the basis you've got to have some data right, without anything, or at least some way of. So the premise of his book is you carry on trying to find data or trying to put inputs into something until it starts to not have the value. You know, by, by drilling down or finding out a more accurate figure to be able to put into some kind of simulator or whatever it is, is it going to be cost effective? You know, are you going to spend more money trying to be more accurate, more precise, than it's actually going to be worth in the long run? And so you know, some of those guesses, like the, the potato guess here, right? If you're looking for a very rough figure, and you've done two projects before, then you know you can come up with some kind of, well, these are the projects before, at say for five. We produce this, and it costs this amount, we produce that, and it costs that amount. It depends on what you want, but these are rough ideas. Right? It's that we're not going to know up front, right? we're going to get over this, that we are able to predict stuff. It's a forecast of what we're, how much money, how long is it going to take us to forecast what people want to know? And we don't know what it's going to take. We don't, you know, it's not going to be 60 millimeters of rain. I'm really happy to know. That was last month. September? Yeah. No, it was August. August. Yeah. Very well. <coughs> Anything else? We um, just on the just a sort of a side note almost. Paul not wanting to sort of take um, ranges and probabilities and that sort of thing. No one wants a range, right? Everyone wants to take The thing is, yeah, but then for some of is. When you think about what Ford's do, they make cars and mm -hmm. bridges and things like that. And in manufacturing, we have tolerances. So you say, like, this dimension is going to be it's, you know, sort of 10 centimetres plus or minus 2 mil or something. And there's an acceptable tolerance that means it's still a valid one. If it falls out that tolerance, it's not valid. And there's also defects. So mm -hmm. it's exactly the same kind of thing. It's actually Ford are in the business of you know, uh, having uncertainty of so the difference is, is it is software, it is a number of apps, and it's an experiment, so we don't actually know where we're going to get to. So this is the thing in their mind that they're So how long does a game of chess going to take? Yeah. So I mean, they accept it. They, they are, the guys I'm working with are very uh, accepting of this range, because they appreciate that there's a lot of uncertainty. And then once you explain something to someone saying, I can't be more specific, and I think this, this is the reason, right? This thing here that we were talking, saying you wanted, is there's a massive variance in that. But we're pretty sure the other thing over here is only two to four weeks. But the other thing you've asked us for is five to twenty weeks, because we've just no idea. If you want to give us more information about that thing, then we can maybe try to do it narrower in our estimate. But it, it starts that conversation, which is it's better than 62 minutes as well. Yeah. Uh, Anything else? Yeah. 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 Well, we're going to wrap up because I hate talks overrun. So thank you all for coming. Uh, if anyone wants a potato, take over them. Let me know.